Welcome, everyone, to today's Town of Chatham Zoning Board of Appeals meeting. The date is January 14th, the year 2021. The meeting is being recorded and will be available shortly hereafter for scheduled and on-demand viewing on any smartphone or tablet device. If anyone else is recording the meeting, please let us know. Pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12th, 2020 order, suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, and the governor's March 23rd, 2020 order imposing strict limitations on the number of people. And I might add, he's had a number of orders since that time. Uh, anyway, limitations on the number of people that may gather in one place. This meeting of the Chatham Zoning Board is being conducted via remote participation. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure, ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings as provided for in the order. A reminder that persons who would like to listen to this meeting while in progress may do so by calling the phone number 508-945-4410, and then you have to put in the conference ID number, which is 224-134-797, and hit the pound. Despite our best efforts, we may not be able to provide the real-time access, and we will post a record of this meeting on the town's website as soon as possible. We'll now have a roll call of all members present that to authorize this in-person meeting. So I will start with Paul and should everyone please give me your full name, Paul. This is Paul Semple. I uh, authorize the meeting uh, and vote yes. Dave Veach. Uh, David H. Veach. Um, uh, vote yes. Buck. This is James Upson. I vote yes. Dave Thompson. Uh, Dave Thompson, and I would vote yes. Dennis. Uh, Dennis Sullivan, yes. Megan. Megan Story, yes. And I am David S. Nixon, and I vote yes. I'm going to ask that any citizens or non-board members participating in the call via the phone only for give us their name and the last four digits of their phone number for identification purposes. All hearing notices today will be read by Sarah B. Clark. Sarah is the PPO for the town. That's the principal permitting officer. She's also the secretary of our board, as well as the Chatham Historic Business District Commission. After the hearing uh, notice is read, then we will have a presentation either by the individual who brought it forth or by a representative. When that has completed, I would ask for anybody in the audience who wishes to speak in favor to do so. And to do that, you would notify by raising your hand on the screen so that Sarah can pick you up and let us know that you wish to speak. I would then read any and all letters received by the board. We would then ask for anybody against the appeal or the application who wishes to speak or ask a question about it to do so. Again, you would do so by putting your hand up so Sarah can see you. We would then, if necessary, have rebuttal testimony. Following that, the board members would ask their questions. When that was done, we would uh, go into deliberation by closing the public hearing and entering into deliberation. Votes on Zoning Board of Appeals and the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, you need to have a super majority vote. In our case, since there are five votes, you need to get four yeses to be successful. Voting today would be Dave Veach, Paul Semple, Buck, Dave Thompson, and myself. I don't think there should be any questions. So we will start with, uh, we would go to application 20-054 first. Sarah? Application number 20-054. <clears throat> Bobby Joe Pippin Art and Randy Art, care of James M. Noor Cross Esquire, mm -hmm. PO Box 707, Chatham Mass 02633. Owner of property located at 26 Hardings Beach Road, also shown on the Town of Chatham's Assessor's mm -hmm. Map 9C, Block 47, Lot 1C. The applicant seeks to install a fence within the Conservancy District. 
The proposed fencing is allowed by special permit under Section 4A3A of the Protective Bylaw. The lot contains 22,422 square feet in the R20 zoning district. A special permit is required under Mass General Law Chapter 40A, Section 9, and Section 8D2B of the Chatham Protective Bylaw. This was continued from September 24th and November 19th of 2020. I have in my hand a letter. This is dated January 11th. It is from James Norcross from a, the law offices of Riley and Norcross. He writes, on behalf of my clients, I'm writing to request a continuance of the hearing currently scheduled for January 14th until your February 25th meeting. The notice of intent application pending with the Conservation Commission has been continued until February 10th. And my clients would like to complete the process with the Conservation Commission prior to a hearing with the ZBA. Thank you for your consideration. Please let me know if you need any additional info. Uh, does anybody have any questions or any comments on this? If so, please speak. <clears throat> okay, then I take that to be affirmative We're moving on. So I would ask Paul for a motion, please. This is Paul Semple. I'll move to grant the continuance to uh, February uh, 25, 2021. David Veach seconds. Okay, we will take the vote now. Uh, Dave Veach. Uh, Veach votes yes. Paul. Semple votes yes. Buck. Buck votes yes. Dave Thompson. Dave Thompson votes yes. And I vote yes. That's unanimous. And we'll go on to the next application, sir, which is 20-082. Application number 20-082, Goodrich Chatham Realty Trust, care of Michael D. Ford Esquire, P.O. Box 485, West Harwich, Mass, 02645. Owner of property located at 110 Old Salt Works Road, also shown on the town of Chatham's assessor's map, 13M, Block 8, Lot C25. The applicant seeks to modify special permit number 18-029, granted on June 18th, 2020, which allowed for the demolition of the existing dwelling and the construction of a new dwelling and garage. The applicant now seeks to modify special permit number 18-029 to allow for an alternate location of the exterior mechanical appliances, AC condensers and generator with floodproof enclosures. The proposed generator enclosure will be located two feet from the northerly abutter, and the proposed AC condenser will be located 2.5 feet from the westerly abutter, where a 25-foot setback is required. Also proposed is the installation of fencing with a within the Conservancy District, as allowed by special permit under Section 4A3A of the Protective Bylaw. The approved building coverage of 4,600 75 square feet, where 2,800 square feet is the maximum allowed, will remain unchanged. The lot is non-conforming in that it contains zero square feet of buildable upland where 20,000 square feet is required. The property contains 57,960 square feet in the R40 zoning district. A special permit is required under Mass General Law Chapter 40A, Section 6 and 9, and Sections 5B and 8D2B of the Chatham Protective Bylaw. Uh, Mr. Ford, uh, the floor is yours. I'm too, not too sure which Mr. Ford, Ford we have today, but the floor is yours. Sure. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. It's Mike uh, Ford here go. this afternoon representing um, Goodrich Realty Trust. Mr. Chairman, notwithstanding the length of the legal ad, this is really more of a housekeeping uh, petition, I would respectfully suggest. Um, what we're doing is uh, seeking the board's permission to move the location of the existing uh, generator and its enclosure uh, from the north easterly corner of the lot. It currently straddles the uh, V zone line and uh, the majority of it is in the velocity zone. And we're moving it out of the velocity zone uh, to another area uh, along the abutter setback. Why are we here for that? We're here for that because uh, currently that is 5.6 feet, that generator off of the abutters lot line. In the new location, the enclosure will be just two feet off the abutters lot line. And so um, it's a change in a non-conforming uh, structure and therefore needs uh, a relief under VV. The other thing that we're doing is um, on the westerly boundary, 
just to the west of the house that's under construction. There are two uh, AC compressor units currently, and uh, we're seeking to move those. They're two feet off the abutters lot line right now. We're seeking to move them a half foot farther away from the lot line and enclose them with a flood proofing enclosure. The reason we're taking the step to uh, use flood proof enclosures around both the generator and the AC units is that otherwise they would need to be elevated. And in elevating them, uh, they would be up, the compressors would be up, so they'd be able to be seen over the top of the um, uh, uh, fence that runs along the common lot line between the abutter to uh, the west uh, and this property. And uh, my client is going to the extent of flood proofing them instead so they don't have to be raised up uh, to that height. The generator as well uh, is not being raised up uh, but is rather being enclosed in an enclosure as well. And therefore that will be hidden from view behind the fence on the abutters lot line where it's two feet off. I should have noted, Mr. Chairman, uh, the line on which the uh, generator uh, abuts is a, a vacant lot not developable, owned by a neighborhood association. There is no house on that lot that is adjacent to the generator where we'll be within two feet of the lot line. So uh, those are the two areas where we need the um, non-conforming relief. We're also here to get an extension of fence within the Conservancy District. Currently, the property is uh, virtually surrounded by existing fence uh, except for uh, an area just to the left of the driveway as you come in and to the right of the driveway. There will, there's a driveway gate that's proposed. It was proposed on the prior plan. It's being moved a little bit farther out towards the road. And there's fencing proposed on either side of it uh, and fencing along the abutters lot line uh, where the generator is going. And that's so the generator will now be behind uh, that fence. All other areas of the lot currently have a fence around the perimeter. We're changing some of the existing chain link fence and existing picket fence to a four foot high picket fence with six gaps between the strips, um, which is for conservation purposes so that wildlife uh, can move through. So it is that fencing, Mr. Chairman, that triggers the second portion of the request uh, because it's located um, within the Conservancy District. That's the extent of what we're looking for on the lot. Everything else stays the same. Um, this was authorized uh, as a replacement home. You may recall you were on the board when it was. This lot has had extensive flooding uh, and the new house that's being built is being built up on pilings. And thus uh, that flooding history is the reason for these flood proof um, uh, uh, vaults around the compressor and around the generator. Happy to take questions. Sean Riley, the site engineer, is also on the line, Mr. Chairman, if there are questions regarding the site plan. Uh, would you please go through the findings that you came up with? Uh, absolutely. So uh, with respect to findings, adequacy of size of the site, including but not limited to maximum lot or building coverage. Um, this lot uh, is over 57,000 square feet, but given the fact that it now, given changes in uh, floodplain, um, it doesn't have any buildable upland uh, as indicated in the ad, uh, even though it's a generous size lot. Notwithstanding, um, the generator is being moved out of the velocity zone, the mechanical units are being flood proofed, and the fencing is uh, simply allowing the rest of the lot where it isn't uh, to be enclosed. Um, so with respect to that first finding, um, I think the lot um, is of sufficient size to take care of uh, the proposed uh, mechanicals and fence. Compatibility, the size of the structure with neighboring properties. What we've tried to do rather than elevating the mechanicals, which the current permit allows us to do, is to keep them at ground level and uh, to put the flood proofing around them. Um, that way they're, they're not being seen outside of the premises itself, given the six foot fences uh, that block them on either side. Extent of proposed increase in non-conforming nature. Uh, we have uh, the generator uh, enclosure is actually getting 3.6 feet closer to the butter setback than where the generator and its enclosure is now in the V zone. 
Again, however, that uh, that lot that it's getting closer to is a, um, a a neighborhood lot. It's not developed. It's vacant, and it's not proposed to be developed. Suitability of the site, including but not limited to impact on neighboring properties. Uh, we don't believe we will have any negative impacts on neighboring properties, given the way that the um, mechanicals will be treated with floodproof enclosures rather than elevating them. Impact of scale, siting, mass, and neighborhood visual character. Uh, same thing. The client's gone to uh, uh, great lengths to floodproof the uh, mechanicals as opposed to elevating them up farther. I don't believe that items six, seven, eight, nine, and ten are applicable, Mr. Chairman, in this case. That would be my findings. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I would now ask uh, for anyone in the audience who wishes to speak in favor of this application to please indicate to Sarah that you would like to speak. I see no one that wishes to speak in favor of the application. Thank you. I will now read the correspondence. The first is dated January 13th. It's from the Conservation Commission and their acting conservation agent, Paul Whiteman. The conservation heard the matter on January 13th as an amended order. The above reference project can be permitted with conditions. The commission continued the above reference matter to their February 3rd for a review of a draft order of conditions by the commission. Then this is a note, the memo from Judith Giorgio, health agent for the town of Chatham. She writes on January 12th, I have reviewed the plan to amend the special permit and to vary the sideline setback requirement for the exterior mechanical appliances, generator and HVAC at the property. I have no concerns about the proposal. Is there anyone in the audience who wishes to speak against this application? If so, please indicate on the screen so that Sarah can recognize you. I see no one that wishes to speak in opposition. Okay, then questions from the board. Let's start with Dennis. Do you have any questions? Uh, Dennis Sullivan, no, I have no questions. Megan. Megan Story, I have no questions. Dave Thompson. Um, Mr. Ford was kind enough to um, describe the uh, flood resistant enclosures. Um, I have no, no more questions. Buck. I have one question about the fence, um, Attorney Ford. It, the, um, in the northeast corner, it says existing six-foot stockade fence to be repaired or replaced. And it looks like it's, or doesn't look like, it is in the VE zone. And that's what you're asking permission to put a six-foot stockade fence in a VE zone? Yeah, the, the fence is already there, uh, Mr. Upson, and um, the client does have uh, dogs, and uh, that, that does allow them to be kept uh, within the yard itself. And the Conservation Commission is allowing, um, we believe, will allow in the order of conditions that's being proposed, uh, the fence in that area. Thank you. Uh, Paul, do you have any questions? Uh, this is Paul Semple. I have no questions. Dave Veach. <clears throat> uh, David Veach. I'm just I'm curious, uh, and, and perhaps this question might go to Sean Riley. Um, so the in closing the um, um, mechanicals, is there any um, is there any possible magnifying of the noise that, or or is it mitigated by having concrete walls around? Yes, and we, we had uh, discussed that at length uh, as part of the design. And actually the, the noise will be um, will be directed above the units rather than out to the sides of the units. So we actually think that it's going to muffle uh, any of the potential. Those units aren't very loud anyway, but um, any of the sound that would come from them. Okay, great. Thank you. That's all I have, Kate. 
Okay, Sean, uh, this is Dave Nixon. Uh, speaking about the enclosures, the vaults, are there tops on these vaults or are they open? No, they are open. They are. So if the water rises to six feet or whatever it might be, uh, then these, they'll be flooded, correct? So if the, if the water rises up to any elevation below elevation 12, which is approximately six feet above the ground, mm -hmm. uh, the, the vault will be dry. Uh, if we happen to get a storm event that is, a, that is more than a foot above the anticipated 100-year storm, then they would be inundated. But um, anything short of that, they'd stay dry. Uh, they've been designed um, to with, uh, withstand any buoyancy forces uh, should they be submerged up to uh, all the way up to the top of the walls. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, Paul, I think we uh, would entertain a motion to go into the deliberation. Yes, this is Paul Semple. I'll move to close the hearing and move into deliberations. David Veach seconds. Okay, we'll vote on that. Dave Veach. Beach votes yes. Paul. Sample votes yes. Buck. Buck votes yes. Dave Thompson. Dave Thompson votes yes. And I vote yes. Okay, let's start with Megan. Uh, I have no issue with it. It seems like they've done their homework and it is a perfectly reasonable request in my opinion. Dave Thompson. I agree with, with uh, Megan. Um, I see nothing wrong with uh, going along with this. Buck. Well, unfortunately, I don't uh, go along with what's said so far. Um, I, I think um, a while back at 27 Little Beach, we had a six foot stockade fence um, that several of the members were concerned about. Uh, in in a, um, I believe it was an AE uh, flood zone, and in this particular case, it's in VE. Now, I know that we don't go on precedence, but um, that discussion and that argument uh, that we had there uh, stuck in my mind, and I can't support this. Paul. This is uh, Paul Semple. It, it seems to me that the uh, the advantage we have in this situation is that we're moving from a, a VE zone to an AE zone with a lot of these components. And uh, we're sort of taking a bad situation and making it better. Uh, if we had our druthers, we probably wouldn't have a house there at all. But the house pre-exists all of uh, our operations. Uh, so um, I don't think I have a problem with the stockade fence assuming that conservation is going to approve it. Dave H. Yes, I, I'm, I'm in agreement with Paul on, on this. Um, definitely, I think it's an improvement to have the, what, the, where, what they're presenting with respect to the mechanicals, and it's going to be much better. And um, there's a stockade fence there already. Um, and so I see this somewhat differently than uh, the issue on Little Beach with respect to the stockade fence. So uh, I don't see any substantial detriment to the neighborhood with any of this. So I can approve yeah. it. Okay, thank you. Dennis? <clears throat> yes, uh, Dennis Sullivan. I would agree with Paul and David, Dave each. Um, my only issue is I wonder if this is going to be the type of construction that we're going to be seeing in Chatham in the future. It's going to be interesting. Okay, and from my perspective, uh, I hear what Buck says, but to me, that was a different situation in that uh, where that fence was going to go, and there isn't one there now, is surrounded by homes, et cetera, and I was concerned about them breaking loose and doing damage and being an impediment, which I don't see that this particular location. So, um, Paul, I think uh, we need a motion. And here we have really two different things. I think I would like to separate them and take the, we'll have two separate votes. One about the AC condensers and the generator and the second about the fence. All right, this is Paul Semple. I'll move to approve the request uh, for a proposed relocation of the generator, mechanical units and enclosures. Uh, as not being substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood than existing 
uh, non-conforming generator mechanicals uh, on the property. David Veach, second. Okay, we'll vote on that. Uh, uh, Dave Veach? Veach votes yes. Paul? Devil votes yes. Buck? Buck votes yes. Dave Thompson? Dave Thompson votes yes. And I vote yes, that's a unanimous vote. Okay, Paul, a motion on the fence. Yes, the, uh, uh, I'll move to approve the request for a uh, special permit for the relocation and uh, continuation of the fencing uh, as not being substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood than the existing situation. Um, and that we go forward on that basis. And David Beach seconds that. Okay, we will vote on that. Uh, Dave Veach? Veach votes yes. Paul? Sample votes yes. Buck? Buck votes no. Dave Thompson? Dave Thompson votes yes. And I vote yes, so that passes four to one. Thank you very much, Mr. Ford. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members. <laughs> okay, Sarah, 20-083. Application number 20-083, Erica, Eric and Trish Lindbergh, care of Rick Roy, 123A Queen Anne Road, Harwich, Mass, 02645, owner of property located at 25 Harbor Hill, also shown on the Town of Chatham's Assessor's Map 11A, Block 22, Lot C2. The applicant seeks a waiver as allowed on, under Section 7B12D for the additional land area requirement for a one bedroom guest unit, which is part of the principal dwelling and is occupied by a member of the immediate family. The existing dwelling and proposed addition comply with the required setbacks and building coverage. The existing building coverage is 2,232 square feet, 5.5%, and the proposed building coverage is 3,208 square feet. 7.9%, or 10% is the maximum allowed. The lot contains 40,500 square feet in the R40 zoning district. A special permit is required under Mass General Law Chapter 40A, Section 9, and Section 8D2B of the Chatham Protective Bylaw. Do we have Mr. Roy with us? You do have Mr. Roy here. Can you hear me? Uh, we sure can. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm here representing the Lindberghs. Uh, the, Eric Lindberg and his uh, and Trish are having Eric's parents uh, reside with them in this dwelling, and they have been going through the design process, and we finally came to an agreement. Uh, it was a little bit of a tough battle with the parents because they are selling and have sold their house down in uh, in Connecticut, and uh, you know they're moving to a smaller environment, so. Uh, we finally got to the point where we came up with this plan. Um, again, as stated by Sarah, we are seeking the uh, relief from the requirement, land requirement, based upon the fact that we'll have a dwelling that has two kitchens in it, so it constitutes basically two dwellings. But uh, the, as far as the site is concerned, uh, you know, and I'll run quickly through the 10 criteria, okay, uh, the adequacy of the size of the site. Obviously, we're not over on site coverage uh, and we do not encroach into a setback. It's a fairly large lot. Uh, and, uh, uh, we, you know, the only nonconformity, uh, it's, you know, certainly capable, you know, it's compatibility to the neighborhood. I built a lot of places down in this neighborhood, so I know that it, it fits in with the neighborhood and have done similar type additions to houses uh, in the neighborhood. Uh, increasing the size, not necessarily making in-laws apartments. Um, you, you know, the like I say, the increase in the nonconformity. We're not increasing a nonconformity. We don't have any other than the relief from uh, the size of the lot relative to the second dwelling. Uh, suitability of the site is fine. Uh, the impact of the scale is 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 fine. Adequacy of the septic system. Uh, we are applying to the uh, Board of Health for IA technology uh, because the addition of the bedroom puts them over their bedroom count, but uh, uh, based upon the bylaws uh, and the rules and regulations for uh, the Board of Health, uh, that should be uh, able to be had without too much trouble. Uh, 
impact of traffic uh, to his parents moving into the house, noise and litter. I don't believe that there's any problem there. And there's certainly plenty of utilities for the area. The interesting part about the site is, is that it sort of sits down in a hole from Harbor Hill Road. So it certainly isn't going to look ominous from that section. And it's covered with plenty of vegetation. So I think that uh, uh, this is an approvable project and I'll be happy to answer any questions that the board members have. Thank you very much. Is there anyone in the audience who would like to speak in favor of this application? If so, please indicate on the screen so that Sarah can recognize you. <clears throat> I see no one that wishes to speak in favor. Okay, then I'll read the correspondence. This is a memo from Judith Giorgio, Board of Health, dated January 12th. I have reviewed the plan to renovate this property. The existing floor plan provided shows four existing bedrooms. The existing septic system is approved for four bedrooms. The proposed dwelling floor plan is for five bedrooms, plus a room labeled an office above the in-law. This would make a total of six bedrooms. An updated septic system may be approved with an IAS for a total of five bedrooms in accordance with the BOH nitrogen loading regulation revisions. Do the proposed floor plan will be required to remove one potential bedroom. Is there anyone in the audience who would like to speak against this application or has a question? If so, please indicate to Sarah now so she can recognize you. I see no one that wishes to speak in opposition or has a specific question. Okay, we'll have questions from the board. We'll start with Dave Thompson. Thank you. Uh, Dave Thompson has no questions, sir. Buck. Buck has no questions. Paul. Uh, this is Paul Semple. Rick, what's, what's your thought about uh, dealing with the bedrooms? Well, I, I am did not know that this is what the letter said okay but okay i can tell you that uh, i will be able to take care of that with judy because uh it's traditional that if there is an open railing uh to the living area down below that the office area will not be construed as a bedroom because it cannot be made private i have a little bit of confidence in that because i was on the board of health when we wrote the nitrogen loading regulations and i know that that's the reason we wrote them that way so uh, I, I'm sure that I can work that out with Judy uh, by, you know, going over the plan with her. She may not be interpreting the fact that the office area is open to the family room down below. Okay, that's the only question I had. Thank you. Dave Veach. Uh, I have no questions, Dave. Thank you. Dennis. Uh, Dennis Sullivan, I have no questions. Megan. Megan, sorry, I have no questions. And I have none. So a motion from Paul, please. Uh, this is Paul Semple. I'll move to close the hearing and move into deliberations. David Veach seconds. All right, voting on that. Dave Veach. Veach votes yes. Paul. Semple votes yes. Buck. Buck votes yes. Dave Thompson. Dave Thompson, yes. And I vote yes. Okay, uh, deliberations, let's start with Buck. Um, I don't see any problem with it. I'll support it. Paul? Yes. I, I agree. I think that the uh, setting of the house is such that uh, the addition will be fine and uh, it's down low, will not create a problem in the neighborhood. So I, I think it meets all our criteria. Dave Veach. Yes, uh, I, I I can certainly support this. It's not there's no substantial detriment to the neighborhood, and it uh, meets all the criteria, um, and it's a nice looking project. Dave Thompson. Mr. Thompson. Okay, we can come back to him. Megan. I'm sorry. 
Yes. Oh, I, I'm sorry. Um, I would vote yes on this. There's no problem at all. Megan? I would also vote yes if I were voting. Dennis? Yes, Dennis Sullivan. It's a nice project. Fits in the neighborhood. If I were voting, I would certainly vote in favor of it. Yes, I don't see any reason that we would think this would be substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood. So I would vote yes also. Okay, uh, before we go into that, uh, is there any reason for conditions? Paul, what do you think of conditions? The usual ones or none or more? Well, there seems to be plenty of room on site uh, for containing any of the construction equipment and so forth, and, and uh, you would need to going down the hill there to get to the location. Um, I guess the question is, is there any impact on construction during the summertime? And um, it seems as if most of the houses are pretty far away from each other there. Uh, Rick, can I ask you, uh, when you plan for construction of this project, should it be approved? Uh, next fall. Did you hear me? I'm sorry, I did not hear you. Okay, sorry about that. No, we don't plan on starting it uh, until next fall. So uh, it should not be any problem with summer traffic anyways. Okay. Uh, do any board members feel that uh, any conditions are necessary or not? I guess, uh, uh, Paul Sample, I think my only condition would be that uh, construction equipment and so forth be contained on site. Okay. Uh, everyone agree with that? I do. Right, this, is, this is Paul Sample. I'll move to approve the application as submitted with the condition that uh, all uh, construction uh, activity and vehicles be contained on site. Okay. David Veach seconds. Okay, uh, we'll take a vote on that. Dave Beach. Is there any possibility that I can say something here? <laughs> Depends what you're going to say. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, if you if you take a look at this lot, okay, uh, it's down in a hole, all right, and uh, the, the you know most of the area that's available is behind the dwelling, not in front of it, all right. So there's a fairly large banking to get up to the street. In all honesty, okay, I think that it would be at different times difficult to keep all of the, you know, whatever's parked, you know, across the front of this piece of property off the street. It's, you know, if I'm, if I've got a cement truck and a, in a pump truck down in the driveway pumping the foundations because it's the only access that I have to it, okay, then the employees of, of the, and the trucks that the foundation guy are going to have are not going to end up being parked down in the yard. There's there's not that much area to park down there. So um, I think because we're basically doing this project in the fall uh, and all of that work will be done, uh, uh, you know, then afterwards when we're doing finished work and painting, I, I feel confident that we can keep the, you know, the, the trucks in the yard. But I just wouldn't want to be, uh, uh, acting as if, or, or or finding out that somebody's going to be chasing me because on the day they pour the foundation, there are vehicles out on the street. Hmm. Well, you know, Rick, uh, I, this project, when I looked at it from Moon Tusser's Lane, um, you know, convinced me it's a good project, you know, you can't see and all that. But I thought to myself, if I was Rick Roy, I'd take this fence down from Moon Custer's Lane. That's the way to get in there for the project, as opposed to going down that driveway. Is that something that's going to happen? Uh, you know, I, I hadn't given that a thought, you know, because there's probably vegetation along the side of Moon Custer's Lane in front of the fence. If the neighbors don't object to us doing that, because that vegetation may not be on, uh, you know, the... Lindbergh's land, you know, so mm -hmm. I have to take a look at it. Certainly, I, I think that's doable for sure. OK, uh, I just, you know, I'm an honest guy, so I just was throwing it out there so that you, you know, would understand, OK, that there's a substantial amount of property that you can't park on between the street and the dwelling because of the steepness of the banking. That's all. OK, well, I, I wouldn't want to see anything parked on Moon Cusser's Lane. I mean, that's a real narrow road. Yeah, uh, exactly. So, I mean, basically the idea is, is that 
you know, you know. Uh, I think the time of the year that the project is being done uh, is is certainly conducive to, uh, you know, uh, not being that much traffic down there. Hopefully COVID will be gone and people will be able to take, go home and take their kids to college or whatever the story is. And, and so, you know, some of the, you know, the population will dissipate as it, has it has done in the past, but who knows? So anyway, so whatever, whatever you feel is, is what you have to do, we'll, we'll work within it. I just wanted to throw it out there. Okay. Rick, so, Rick, uh, Yep. This is Paul Semple. I have one question for Rick. I wonder whether uh, if we put a time frame for uh, staying on the uh, staying on the property. In other words, would it be appropriate to say that within the first uh, six weeks or something of starting the project, uh, they would not have to be on the property, but that add thereafter when the foundation and so forth is done, uh, yeah, that's that they would be? Yeah, that certainly would be helpful. Okay, you know, so you know, if that's the compromise that makes everybody feel half happy, that's much better than not being able to do it at all. Uh, what I, would be the appropriate? What would be the appropriate time frame then? Well, six weeks is a good time frame. You know, I, I mean, basically, what's what's a little bit difficult is just getting boom trucks and form trucks and cement trucks, you know, jammed all on the property at the same time. Once you get beyond that. It gets a little bit easier. The trucks are smaller, you know. They make a delivery and they leave, uh, you know. So, uh, you know, that would be good if you if you have to condition it. That would be a a, a good time frame. Well, yeah, Paul, I think that's a great idea myself. All right. Well, let me uh, move to approve the application uh, as submitted with the condition that uh, construction uh, activity and vehicles would be contained on site. Um, after the first uh, six weeks of uh, construction start. Uh, David Beach seconds that. Okay, then we'll vote on the whole package. Uh, Dave Veach? Um, Beach votes yes. Paul? Double votes yes. Buck? Buck votes yes. Dave Thompson? Dave Thompson votes yes. And I vote yes, that's a unanimous vote. Thank you very much, Mr. Roy. Thank you very much, have a good day. Okay, uh, Sarah, we go on to 20-070. Application number 20-070, Hydrangea Properties, LLC, care of William F. Riley Esquire, P.O. Box 707, Chatham, Mass. 02633, owner of property located at 63 Cross Street, also shown on the town of Chatham's assessors, map 15D, block 95, lot 67. The applicant seeks to enlarge, extend, or change a non-conforming dwelling on a, on a conforming lot via the construction of additions. The existing dwelling and proposed additions conform to the road and abutter setbacks requirements. The existing building coverage is 3,358 square feet, and the proposed building coverage is 4,377 square feet, where 2,900 square feet is the maximum allowed. The lot contains 22,639 square feet in the R20. Zoning District. A special permit is required under Mass General Law Chapter 40A, Section 6, and Section 5B of the Chatham Protective Bylaw. This was continued from November 19th, 2020. Mr. Riley, are you there? Yes, good afternoon. Uh, Bill Riley uh, for uh, Hydrangea Properties. Eric Tolley, the architect, is also available. Um, taken to heart. Uh, the comments at the last meeting, uh, the, the plan has been revised, so there's no longer a covered porch over the front of the building. Uh, they still want to have a screened porch uh, on the, the corner of the house facing Kent Place, and they'd like to have a covered entrance uh, uh, to the porch. The uh, previously... Uh, the proposal was to increase coverage by uh, 1,000 square feet. And uh, because of the reductions, uh, we're, they're no longer, uh, now they're only asking for an increase in coverage of 500 square feet, more or less. The, uh, I've lost my site plan here, but uh, I know that it's about uh, 3,800 square feet now as opposed to the 4,377 square feet they were 
uh, had previously proposed. Yeah, I think Sarah has the exact number. Do you, Sarah? Uh, the exact number of proposed building coverage is 3,802 square feet. Okay. Uh, go ahead, Mr. Riley. Yeah, well, I, you know, so anyway, the, the, uh, uh, the design that Eric had uh, for, the, for, the, uh, for the porches, uh, I think, is very much in keeping with the design of the, of the structure. They're also proposing a small addition on the southwest corner uh, where there would be uh, one to have a mud room uh, at, at the entrance to the house there. And they were the. Uh, I think that uh, you know the concerns that that, that the commission members, uh, the, uh, pardon me, the ZBA members raised at the last meeting, I think are, are dealt with in this uh, these revisions. And I I hope you'll agree. Uh, I can run through the criteria, but because the plans are uh, a screen porch and a uh, covered entrance with a, with a very small addition, uh, there's really no significant change in the impact uh, on the neighborhood. Uh, the, the, uh, and the proposed screen porches on the Kent Place side are 46 feet back uh, from the street. So uh, in terms of uh, sideline uh, dimensions, uh, we're very much in compliance. The the uh, small addition on the southwest corner, uh, where they proposed to put a mud room, is uh, meets the sideline setback. They're 22 feet from the sideline, where where 20 feet is required. So I think the uh, pardon me, where 15 feet is required. So uh, we think that uh, the impact on the Streetscape, uh, the visual character of the neighborhood uh, is, well, they, you know, we think it's an improvement. Uh, but uh, certainly, uh, I would suggest it's not substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood. And as I say, Eric's design supports for the, for the uh, proposed coverings, I think, is, is uh, particularly attractive. I mean, it mimics what's already there in terms of covered porches. Uh, so I think uh, that would be our presentation, and uh, happy to answer any questions. And Eric's available to answer questions as well. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Riley. Uh, is there anyone in the audience who wishes to speak in favor of this proposal? If so, please indicate on the screen so Sarah can see you. I see no one that wishes to speak in favor of the proposal. Okay, thank you. Uh, so the correspondence consists of uh, a letter. This is from Michelle Clark, and it's dated December 7th. The applicant was before the Historical Commission on November 17th with an application for partial demolition of both the main structure as well as the carriage house. The scope of the work included a replacement of all windows and trim on both the carriage house and main house, and in addition, the removal of the skylight at the rear of the house, new roofing, two new additions, two new screen porches, one covered porch, and also proposed to wrap the existing covered porch across the front of the house. The Historical Commission determined that both structures are historically significant, but determined that the proposed changes will not materially diminish the historical significance of the structures. The Commission did not impose a demolition delay for either structure. Since that determination, the applicant's representative submitted revised plans that proposed the removal of the previously approved front porch and the removal of the screen porch on the south side of the house. Both of these changes have been approved. If you would like any additional information, let me know. Well, that's the extent of the correspondence. Is there anyone in the audience who wishes to speak against or has a specific question about this application? If so, please indicate now so that Sarah can recognize you. Mr. Chairman, we have um, one member of the audience who wishes to speak. Very good. Hello, this is uh, Bob Cushing. 
I don't know if you can hear me or not. Yes, we can. Good, thank you. We own the house at 71 Cross Street, and uh, I just want to start. I'm not opposing the uh, change. I just have a couple questions. I think it'll be a great um, addition uh, with this this project. I think it'll be a great addition to the area, so I, I do support it. But my questions, I have three of them. First one is is at the November zoning board meeting, I had asked a question as to whether the property would be a residence or a rental. Mr. Riley responded that it would be a single family dwelling. That was really not the intent of the question. So if you don't mind, I'm going to reword it. Will this property be rented? Uh, in my conversations with uh, Sean Campbell, whose family will be living there, is that this house is going to be used as a residence for Sean's family. That's great. Thank you. And the second was with respect to the additions. You know, this is a big house. And I know you've reduced the number of bedrooms from 11 to 9, and you have these, you know, kind of gathering areas. Has there been any consideration as to the light or noise spilling out from the house out onto Kent Street or Cross Street or with the neighbors? Uh, not that I'm aware of. I don't know if, if Eric is available. He might address that, but I mean, it's a single family residence, so. <laughs> Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, this is Eric Tolley, if I may. Yes, Eric, go ahead. Um, you know, given that the, uh, I, I think the former use of the property was either in or lodging house. And, you know, I think that the, uh, the transition from that type of use to a single family dwelling would actually diminish um, noise and uh, light pollution and, and certainly traffic where it's going to be used by a single family rather than uh, transient, uh, shall we say. Um, occupants, so uh, there was. It certainly makes sense to think that there would be no more light or, or noise pollution, and we certainly believe that there is potential for less. Okay, thank you, Mr. Tully. Uh, Mr. Cushing, your third question. Third question with respect to there's an easement on our property between 71 Cross Street and 63 Cross Street, and this goes back. This prop, this easement goes back several years prior to where we owned it but it allows the 63 Cross Street property owners to have access to a back part of our property for the maintenance of a, of a flower garden and a, and a gazebo. Um, after we bought the property, we did seek the council. We did actually have a conversation with Mr. Riley, found out that he was, I think he may have, him or someone in his office may have actually drafted up that easement. Uh, but we got a lot of comfort out of it, the fact that that easement was gonna be limited to the maintenance of a garden and a gazebo. In December, when I went down to look at the property, I noticed that the gazebo had been uh, taken down, demolished, and removed as part of the, it looks like it was done as part of the demolition that was done to the main building itself. So my, you know, I've reached out to Mr. Uh, Mr. Campbell. I wrote him an email back in November, November 3rd, kind of welcoming him to the area and wanting to get together to talk about the easement. I did, did not hear back. I, you sent an email to Mr. Riley on December 4th at his office to talk about the gazebo, why the, you know, what the gazebo was taken down without my notification or my approval. And I don't think it was consistent with the easement requirements. In December 10th, I wrote a letter to Mr. Riley, again, asking for his help to get in touch with his client. I didn't hear back. December okay, 20th, Mr. Cushing, Mr. Cushing, I'm going to interrupt here. You're talking about something that has absolutely nothing to do with the Zoning Board of Appeals. You're yeah. talking about a legal issue. So uh, I will have to stop this questioning. Did you have any other question? Nope. I just I appreciate the opportunity to, to speak. And, and I, as I say, I am in support of this project. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, so questions from the board. Let's start with Paul. This is Paul Semple. I have no questions. Dave Veach. Uh, David Veach has no questions. Dennis. Uh, Dennis Sullivan. No, I have no questions. Megan. Megan also has no questions. Dave Thompson. Dave Thompson does not have any questions either. Buck. Buck has no questions. And I have none. So I would entertain a motion. Paul. Uh, this is Paul Semple. I'll move to close the hearing and move into deliberations. David Veach seconds. Okay, we got a vote on that. Mr. Veach? Veach votes yes. Paul? Semple votes yes. Buck? Buck votes yes. Dave Thompson? Dave Thompson votes yes. 
and I vote yes. So let's uh, let's start with Dave Veach. Um, well, I think that this um, uh, actually is quite an improvement over what they proposed previously. Uh, it looks very nice. Um, certainly uh, um, took care of any consider any concerns I had the previous. Uh, and so um, it's certainly not substantially more detrimental in the neighborhood. It meets our criteria, and uh, I can enthusiastically support it. Dennis. Uh, Dennis Sullivan, yeah, I was in favor of the original project, so I certainly would be in favor of this one if I were voting. I think it's a nice project. I think it lends itself to the, to the streetscape. It's going to make it look much better, um, and I would certainly vote in favor of it if I were voting. Megan. I would also definitely vote in favor of it uh, if I were voting. I think, yeah. Dave Thompson. I think this is a wonderful improvement. This uh, this house is uh, an absolutely gorgeous, gorgeous building. Um, I'm looking forward to see what it looks like uh, down the road. I definitely am voting yes. Buck. I was looking forward to a chart showing the size of the homes in the immediate neighborhood uh, going down uh, Kent Place. Um, the gentleman that just spoke next door, I think he said 71 cross um, and across the street. Um, we don't have that information. I think that house is the biggest house in the neighborhood and we're increasing it some more. I have reservations. Okay, uh, Paul. Yes, I did not have a problem with the proposal before. I think it's only been uh, improved from uh, the comments uh, made by the board members. So um, I intend to vote in favor. Uh, from my standpoint, I, I really objected to the original plan. That porch across the front of it to me uh, destroyed the building in my view and in the neighborhoods view i thought but here it's been reduced so that we're only this has been reduced by 575 square feet from the previous thing the porch in front is gone a screen porch on the left as you look at that's okay and closing the entrance on the right that makes sense so uh while it's not perfect it certainly is not substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood and i'll be voting for it uh buck did you want to say anything else or are you done no, I, uh, you okay. know, I, heard, I heard what everybody's thinking, and I was just concerned, but okay. nothing to upset the apple cart. Okay, very good. Then, Paul, uh, do you see that we need to have any conditions whatsoever on this? Well, uh, it seems to me the lot is big enough to be able to handle the uh, construction on vehicle act activity and vehicles on site. Uh, in terms of the time frame within which to do this, I don't know what their intentions are. Well, we can ask Mr. Riley. What's your uh, what's the uh, construction schedule, Mr. Riley? Uh, actually, Eric, uh, if Eric is still with us, Eric Tolley would have a better handle on okay. that. Okay. Okay, yes. Eric. Mr. Chairman, this is Eric Tolley. Thank you. Uh, the intent is to start this spring, and, and I agree with the previous speaker that the the site is plenty big, so that we would not need to have any vehicles in the street. Um, so, you know, if, if there were to be a condition, I would ask that we be allowed to start and continue throughout the summer, um, with, you know, and we can certainly say that there will be no construction vehicles parked, um, off of the physical property or on the street. You know, uh, in that yeah. regard, if I could just add, yeah. the, uh, I mean, the, the things that, uh, the Campbell family is going to be doing is, you know, replacing the windows. Uh, there will be a small addition on the southwest corner, uh, but basically it's just adding porches. And, and I, you know, and you know because the because the structure is so large, uh, you know the renovations uh, are going to take some time. Uh, but you know, replacing windows, a lot of the work is going to be inside. Eric, I think Eric can answer that question. And and so uh, we'd really like to be able to start and just move right through uh, the summertime. Uh, Mr. Riley, uh, do you think uh, that my, my problem is uh, weekend work 
and also the hours, you know, sticking with eight to five. Do you see any problem with conditioning it with those two? Absolutely not. Okay. Okay. Well, I, I think I would be satisfied with those two and skip the business about where the vehicles are parked. I would uh, adhere to Mr. Mr. Tolley's statement that they'll keep them on online. Uh, anyone disagree with that? Well, this, this is this is Paul Semple. Let me just see if I understand. What we're saying then is the construction activity and vehicles will be contained on site. Yes. Because that's a very congested area. It needs to be on site, I think. That's right. Oh, absolutely. And then, Every, uh, everybody agrees with that. <laughs> right, right. And then our normal conditions would be between June 30th and Labor Day, no exterior construction will be allowed. And yeah, I'm, work I'm, will be permitted on, on weekends, and the construction activity would be between 8 and 5. Yeah, personally, I don't think we have to worry about no exterior construction uh, between June 30th and Labor Day because what it involved is not putting up a house or a foundation or all the rest of it that I think uh, restricting it to no work should be permitted on weekends and also activity uh, can only be between 8 a.m. and 5 p.m. I think that's enough to go with vehicles contained on the site. All right, I have no problem with that. I'll, I'll move to approve the application as submitted with the conditions that uh, all construction activity and vehicles would be contained on site and that between June 30th and Labor Day, uh, no work shall be permitted on weekends and construction activity would be between 8 a.m. and 5 p.m. only. Uh, David Veach could second that. Okay, uh, then the vote, Dave Veach. Um, um, Veach votes yes. Paul. Sample votes yes. Buck. Buck votes yes. Dave Thompson. Dave Thompson, yes. And I vote yes, so thank you very much, Mr. Riley. Okay, uh, application 20-084, Sarah. Application number 20-084, Eastward MBT LLC, care of William F. Riley Esquire, PO Box 707, Chatham, Mass. 02633, agreed vendee of property located at 155 and 157 Bridge Street. Also shown on, on the Town of Chatham's Assessor's Map 15B, <laughs> Block 1B, Lot Oops. 1B. The applicant <laughs> seeks to enlarge, extend, or change no. two non-conforming dwellings on a non-conforming lot via the demolition of the existing dwellings and the construction of two new dwellings. The existing dwelling, 155 Bridge Street, is non-conforming in that it is located partially within the Coastal Conservancy District, floodplain elevation 12. The existing dwelling at 157 Bridge Street is non-conforming and that it is located 26 feet from the Coastal Conservancy District and 24.8 feet from the easterly abutter where a 25-foot setback is required. The proposed dwelling at 155 Bridge Street will be non-conforming and that it will remain partially within the Coastal Conservancy District where a 50-foot setback is required. The proposed dwelling at 157 Bridge Street will comply with all setback requirements of the bylaw. The existing building coverage is 6,928 square feet, 9.7%, and the proposed building coverage is 7,113 square feet, 9.9%, where 10% is the maximum allowed. The lot is non-conforming and that it contains two dwellings where only one dwelling is allowed. The lot contains 3.13 acres and 71,160 square feet of buildable upland in the R40 zoning district. A special permit is required under Mass General Law, Chapter 40A, Section 6, and Section 5B of the Chatham Protective Bylaw. Mr. Riley. Uh, uh, good afternoon, uh, Bill Riley, on behalf of uh, Eastwood Companies. Uh, we have uh, Karen Kempton, the architect, is with us today, and uh, I think Dave Clark is too, because um, he did the plan. So this is a situation where uh, the previous owner uh, built both these houses. The, originally, it was two lots. Uh, and then, uh, I don't know, 20 or 30 years ago, to save real estate tax dollars, he did a perimeter plan. Uh, and he did save some real estate tax dollars. However, when... Uh, 
when they decided to sell the property, they learned they could no longer divide the property in the, in the same manner. So, uh, so we're proposing to have both these residences on a single lot. Uh, ultimately, uh, they'll be held in a condominium form of ownership. Uh, so the, uh, the goal uh, was to pull the buildings back, uh, to move them, you know, away from uh, the coastal resource areas, uh, but to build two appropriate uh, homes in a beautiful setting. Uh, you know, they're both, you know, far off from the road, uh, and they're, they're also a long way from the water, as you can see by the plan. Uh, but the uh, we, we have been to uh, the Conservation Commission. Uh, I haven't seen their letter, if they had one. Uh, I have it. So it's, oh, good. And the, the, uh, they had a couple of questions. Uh, we made a minor revision to the plan, uh, which is the plan you have in front of you. And the, uh, we're providing it with a little more information. We're going to be meeting with the Conservation Commission again on the 27th of this month uh, with the goal uh, that we will have a, an order of conditions allowing the construction as shown on this plan uh, at the February 3rd work session uh, of the Conservation Commission. Um, so Karen is with us and uh, I'd like to have her explain uh, the design and, and, and how they came to that design. Karen, you there? I am here. Cool. Uh, Sarah, if you could pull up the site plan again. I'm Karen Hampton, architect for 155 and 157 Bridge Street. We started this project last summer by having a team meeting at the property. Uh, the team consisted of David Clark, Teresa Sprague, uh, the folks at Eastward, Bill Riley, and myself. And we, we expected the best use for both houses um, taking into account grading, location and basis species, and setbacks from the top of bank. We agreed that 155, which is the house on the left, should be located at the point of the property for views of Mitchell River, the drawbridge, and the harbor beyond. We also wanted to move the house out of the 0 to 50 setback from the top of bank. So the proposed house has slid back 80 feet from the existing footprint. By moving it back, we were able to rise above the floodplain contour, which is beneficial to both the house and to the surrounding environment. By moving the footprint of the house back, we believe that it is also less prominent from Bridge Street and opens up the promontory to the north side views of Mitchell River. Uh, for both houses, we knew we needed three car garages. Uh, so let's bring up 155, the front elevation. Um, we needed three car garages and pool areas to be comparable with today's market. And the area of a three car garage does use up quite a bit of building coverage, but we have disguised it by having the garage doors face away from the street and into the private entries courts of both houses. We think that the visible rear elevation of 155 we could go to uh, is an attractive facade that is broken up by gambrel wings, balconies, decks, and screen porch. We could look at the rear elevation, scroll down. So this is visible from Bridge Street. It is set back, but we think it's an interesting and attractive elevation. All those gambrel gables are in different planes, and the roof lines are broken up by the dormers and the gambrels and the drop down um, screen porch roof line. We are two feet below the allowed ridge height, uh, yet the gambrel gable wings give a verticality to the structure that breaks up the massing. While the house has 5,700 square feet of living space on the first and second floors, we feel that the L-shaped home is reduced in scale by the intersecting roof lines and separated individual dormers for the second floor space. So if we go back to the front elevation, 
you can see that the second floor space is really just in a couple of dormers and in the Gambrel gables. So if we go to house, the house plan for 157 Bridge Street, it is a traditional full cape with a center dormer. Although the entry to the house does face Bridge Street, the garage doors of the three car garage face away from the public view and into the circular courtyard. This house has 4,600 square feet of living space. It has a traditional feel from the front entry with its L-shaped footprint and second floor space uh, in the stepped in dormer. The views from the rear of the house look north over Mitchell River. The house is moved back from the original footprint by 50 feet and is totally out of the zero to 50 setback to the top of bank. The ridge height is 25 feet, which is four feet below the allowed ridge height. Um, and the entrance to both houses, if we can go back to the site plan, are separated uh, 120 linear feet from each other. Uh, so the driveways are separated so that it does feel like two private um, areas to get into these homes. They are both have long private drives and both houses uh, are over 100 feet back from Bridge Street. We hope that you like these two distinct styles of homes, one a Gambrel and one a traditional Cape, both tucked back from Bridge Street and moved further back from the bank of Mitchell River and the Promontory Point. Although large in living space for comfortable living on waterfront properties, these are both reduced in visual mass and scale by the location on the property, their L-shaped footprints, and second floor space hidden in dormers. Um, that's it. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Karen. The, uh, Mr. Chairman, I can, I can run through the criteria. Please do. All right, so uh, adequacy of the size of the site, including but not limited to uh, maximum lot or building covers. Uh, the uh, uh, so our, our billing coverage is uh, you know nine point three percent below the ten percent allowed in our bylaw. The uh, one thing to keep in mind when you think about this property, as Sarah read from the ad, is over three acres in size, one hundred thirty. 6,000 square feet, but there's only 71,000 square feet of buildable upland. So it was, uh, uh, you know, it was adequate for the size of the proposed structure. And, and uh, the fact that we're able to uh, meet uh, setbacks from the conservancy district while still constructing, you know, a home that's suitable for this area, I think is a tribute to uh, Karen's design capabilities. Compatibility of the size of the proposed structure with neighboring properties. You know, I suppose it depends on you know where you're where you're looking. I mean, the the uh, uh, if you look directly across the river, uh, the home up on the hill, uh, its address is is a Stage Harbor Road, is a very substantial house. The houses uh, set lower are are more modest in size. The as you go up the Mitchell River. And you, and you come along uh, newer houses, uh, you know, uh, they get they get larger, and they're very much consistent with the size of this proposed structure. The if you go up uh, Bridge Street um, towards uh, the lighthouse, um, you know, we have those great rambling older homes. Uh, built by the original owners of the property who, who actually bought the property back in the 1930s. Uh, you know, Esther Underwood Johnson, um, her sister Lorna, and her other sister Nina. And then when you go up closer to uh, the lighthouse, you come to the Fleischmann Estate. Uh, again, you know, very significant structures. Uh, and I think that the uh, Karen's work uh, greatly reflects, reflects that. Uh, directly across the street from the property is uh, the, the big yellow house, 
homestead in, in the middle of that lot. That's another very large structure. Uh, uh, again, on the other side of that house is the McLaughlin property, which is you know, a very significant structure that actually was approved by this board. So I think that uh, given the neighborhood, uh, the, uh, that the proposed structure, and I'll mention, and I'll say both structures, are really compatible with the size of proposed neighboring properties. Uh, the proposed increase in nonconforming nature, uh, we're actually reducing uh, some of the nonconformities on the property. Uh, you know, we are increasing building coverage uh, a little bit, uh, but the uh, I think there's a, a much more significant reduction in nonconformity by moving the, prop, the buildings away from the water uh, than and the modest increase in building coverage. <clears throat> Suitability of the site, including but not limited to impact on neighboring properties or on the natural environment, including slopes, vegetation, wetlands, groundwater, water bodies, and stormwater runoff. Again, as I uh, indicated earlier, uh, you know, we're working with the Conservation Commission uh, and you know, the protection that, that they're providing uh, to the natural environment uh, uh, makes it clear that uh, you know, this project is not going to do any harm. And in fact, by moving the buildings away from uh, away from the water, will actually uh, improve uh, some aspects of the natural environment. Uh, impact of scale siting and mass on neighborhood visual character, including views, vistas, and streetscapes. Um, the uh, as we, as we have learned from Peter Acton, the great kayaker, on his kayaking reward, uh, you know, the view from the water is, is important. Uh, and the, here, uh, you know, the structures will be substantially back from the water. It's a lot of vegetation. Uh, it's not clear to me how visible they're going to be, but uh, if you look at 155, as Sarah's got it on the screen, you know, uh, I think that the new structure, being further away uh, and candidly more attractive design, uh, is actually going to be improvement on the neighborhood visual character. Uh, I think the the other building is even further away from the water uh, and with substantial vegetation between it and the water. I don't think there's going to be any significant uh, visibility of that structure from the water. I mean, to the extent that it is, as Karen indicated, you know, it's a classic full cape. And uh, so I, I think, you know, that the impact is going to be uh, an improvement over what is not a particularly handsome structure that's there today. Uh, we don't think there's any impact on the streetscapes uh, because the buildings are all are reach over 100 feet away from the from the street and down kind of a curving driveway. Uh, wow, where are you going, Sarah? <laughs> In any event, uh, you know so. We think that the impact of scale siting and mass on enabled visual character is, uh, we think it's an improvement, uh, but we, we believe that it's a clearly not uh, substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood. You know, compatibility with the proposed use, the single family residents, both of them, and a the single family neighborhood, and so they're compatible. Uh, method of sewage disposal, you know, they're going to have a brand new. Uh, septic systems, uh, you know, there'll be no impact on traffic flow and safety. Uh, that'd be our presentation, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Is there anyone in the audience who wishes to speak in favor of this application? If so, please indicate on the screen now that Sarah, so that Sarah can recognize you. I see no one that wishes to speak in favor of the application. 
Okay, I'll read the correspondence. First, we have a memo. This is from Judith Giorgio, health agent, Board of Health, Town of Chatham. She writes on January 12th, I have reviewed the plan to demo and rebuild the dwellings. The lot can support the proposed nine bedrooms in accordance with the Board of Health nitrogen loading regulation. The new dwelling at number 157 on the western side of the property appears to encroach on the existing septic system, which may require construction of a new system. The property on the eastern side, number 155, has a septic system that was built for an existing three-bedroom dwelling and will require upgrade to accommodate the new dwelling. New septic systems will require review to determine setbacks to coastal banks are met. Then we have uh, a letter. This is dated January 13th. It is from the Conservation Commission and specifically the acting conservation agent, Paul Whiteman. Uh, he writes that, let's see, the applicant seeks to enlarge, extend, or change two non-conforming dwellings on a non-conforming lot by the demolition of the existing dwellings and the construction of two new dwellings. The existing dwelling, 155 Bridge, is non-conforming in that it is located partially within the coastal Conservancy District floodplain elevation 12. The existing dwelling at 157 Bridge is non-conforming in that it is located 26 feet from the Coastal Conservancy District and 24.8 feet from the Easterly Abutter, where a 25-foot setback is required. The proposed dwelling at 155 will be non-conforming in that it will remain partially within the Coastal Conservancy District, where a 50-foot setback is required. The proposed dwelling at 157 will comply with all setback requirements of the bylaw. The existing building coverage is uh, 6928, which is 9.7 percent, and the proposed building coverage is going to be 9.9 percent, .9 where 10 percent of this is the max. The lot is non-conforming, and then it contains two dwellings where only one dwelling is allowed. Lot contains so and so forth. The above reference matter was continued to January 27th for further deliberations. No testimony was heard on January 13th. And then we have a letter. This is from Ali Sabatino. She's the principal planner for the town of Chatham. And she is writing in regard to the planning board. The planning board at their January 11th meeting reviewed the zoning board's request for comment. Um, after review of the request, the, vote, the board voted 7-0-0 to send a positive recommendation with the condition that the driveway shall be constructed of a permeable material and shall be constructed in a manner which permits the unobstructed flow of water. And that's it. So is there anyone in the audience who wishes to speak either against this application or has a specific question? If so, please indicate to Sarah now so that you can be recognized. We have no one in the audience that wishes to speak in opposition or has a specific question. Okay, then we'll have questions from the board. Let's well, start. Uh, with Kevin, before you, before you go there, with regard to the, uh, the comments by Ali Sabatino, um, our presentation to the planning board, you may recall that when the driveway is in the conservancy district, uh, they are requested to opine on that. And we have uh, 311 square feet of the uh, semicircular drive right there that, in front of it that's in the conservancy district. So we had to go have a chat with them, which we were happy to do. Uh, and what we reported to them was that the circle and the uh, the apron going into the garages would be uh, most likely shell or gravel, something like that, permeable in any event. But the long drive coming in uh, most likely would be paved. We don't know, but the I just want to make sure that we don't end up with a condition that says the entire driveway has to be uh, permeable. Uh, you know, so, I mean, their jurisdiction is only that 311 square feet. And you know, we plan on doing, you know, uh, either shell or gravel, so it would be permeable in any event. But 
we, we'd like the right, the ability to have the rest of it paid. Okay, thank you, Mr. Riley. Uh, questions from the board, Dave Veach. Uh, I have no questions, Dave, thank you. Paul. Uh, this is Paul Semple, I have no questions. Buck. Well, I kind of have a, a, a comment. Um, I felt kind of uh, left out with uh, Karen's presentation, which sounded excellent, but I could only hear uh, part of it. it. It seemed to fade in and out. I don't know what the problem was. I wish it was uh, that I could have heard the whole thing. That's just, that's my question comment. Dave Thompson. Uh, thank you. Um, I have no questions for Bill. Actually, I do have one question. Bill, are you, are you going to keep the um, tennis court? No. no. Thank you. No Meg more questions. Megan? I don't have any questions. <clears throat> Dennis? Um, yeah, Dennis, I just have one question to Bill Riley. Um, when you condo this lot, is that going to have any effect on the Sideline requirements. No, no, the, the uh, I didn't think so. But yeah, no, I mean the the there won't be any interior lines to be set back from. Uh, the only the only lines we have to be set back from are the ones that form the perimeter of the lot. Uh, naturally, uh, because of the uh, you know type of prop you know type of ornament we anticipate here, uh, the homes will be uh, further apart than required by Chatham sideline setback requirements if, if there were a line between the two buildings. Okay, that's, thank you, that's all I that's have. Great, I hope. <laughs> yeah. Okay, uh, and I have no questions. So Paul, a motion please. Yes, this is Paul Semple. I'll move to close the hearing and move into deliberations. And we'll take a vote. Oh, Dave? Dave each seconds. All right, we'll take a vote on that. Dave Each? Beach votes yes. Paul? Apple votes yes. Buck? Buck votes yes. Dave Thompson? Dave Thompson votes yes. And I vote yes. Okay. Deliberations. Let's start with Paul. Well, this is Paul Semple. It's uh, quite a piece of property there. There's a lot of room on it, and uh, I think there is enough room to accommodate uh, the size of the houses that are involved here. And they are substantially not seen from uh, the road or, I think, substantially from the water. Uh, interestingly enough, when I was out there, there were two deer that were on the property. And so there is exposure to uh, a local conservation area that I think comes in across the street farther up. But uh, it seems to me this satisfies our criteria, so I intend to vote yes. Buck. Well, <clears throat> if I was on conservation, I'd, uh, I'd have some problems. Um, the letter we received from conservation stated pretty much everything we already know. They didn't uh, say anything specifically on how they felt about it for their initial bite of the apple. Um, it looks to me that the big house on the west side is still uh, with the pool and the patio and a majority of the house, 75% of it is still within the conservancy district. And I can understand that that would be a you know, a reasonable solution, but they have 71,000, almost two acres of land that's outside of the Conservancy District that could clearly uh, hold two houses. Um, their, their current design kind of uh, uses a lot of driveway to eat up a lot of the building space. Um, I, I really would like to hear conservation's uh, final, uh, we'll say, input before uh, being asked to make a decision on this application. Okay. Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, yes. Mr. Chairman, just if I could uh, try to help uh, Buck out here. I mean, 
part of the problem with the report that was read today is that the uh, there's been a change in staff over at the uh, Conservation Commission. And Kelly Harper has left, and Paul Whiteman uh, uh, has, is filling in. And so, as you can tell, uh, you know, Paul's letter basically copied the ad <laughs> uh, that Sarah had already read uh, today. But I, I can report to you that we had a meeting with them. Uh, they, had, they had a couple of questions that uh, we have to provide additional information for uh, coming up on the 27th. Uh, but there were no significant concerns or th whatever concerns they had were addressed by David Clark, uh, who was uh, president. I don't know if he's here with us today or not. Uh, but the the uh, and the idea and what we talked about at that last meeting uh, was we we'll continue to the 27th for just sort of a little cleanup, and then it's going to go to the February 3rd work session to write the order of conditions to allow the buildings to be constructed uh, as they are on this plan. So I don't know if that makes you feel any better, Buck, but that's what happened. Mr. Chair? Yes, Bob. So in our 10 criteria, um, maybe I'm doing it wrong, but I don't see where there's a lot of uh, about addressing whether it's in the uh, conservancy, developing in the conservancy district or developing in the uh, area that's outside of the conservancy district. And so I can understand and appreciate that we probably meet the 10 criteria. Um, but the fact that you have almost two acres of land uh, that's buildable, that's outside of the conservancy, I think that's um, a major issue that uh, now if conservation doesn't uh, doesn't address it, I'm still uncomfortable. And I, and I think Bill made a good comment, Attorney Riley made a good comment that, you know, they are, they're way backlog and they're busy, busy, busy. And so maybe that would be the reason for that answer. But I, I, I still have a problem with so much of the development being left in the conservancy district when there's plenty of buildable land. I, um, I would hope some of the other members would feel the same way. Uh, Bill or uh, Karen, did you want to respond to Buck's issue? I'll be happy to. The, uh, uh, when we discussed these things at the Conservation Commission, uh, one of the things we do is we start with, what do you have now? And so I don't know if you can expand the plan a little bit, uh, Sarah, or not. But the, the uh, right now, 155, uh, which is the you know the left hand house, is entirely in the conservancy district, uh, and so the you know when we pull back from the conservancy district, the conservation commission generally. Uh, thinks that's a good thing. Uh, in addition, so we're, we're pulling it back. You know, we, we still have a little bit in the conservancy district, but we'll pull it back. Now, the value of the property is, is the ability to look at the Mitchell River and look up into the Mill Pond and look back towards Stage Harbor. And so if we put the house up by the road, you know, we lose a very significant part of the value. And so uh, when we deal with the Conservation Commission, they say, well, well, what are you going to give us? Well, we have an extensive uh, invasive plant mitigation plan, uh, and we're, so we're taking out invasive growth, which is uh, dominates the shoreline, uh, and we're re 
putting in native plantings. And so when the Conservation Commission considers the fact that, A, we're moving the buildings back uh, and we are providing, uh, you know, mitigation from in, all the invasive plants, they take that and they weigh it in a balance and they say, okay, we think we can approve this because uh, given everything, the proposal is an improvement. Now, they're not saying it's perfect, which is what Buck wants, and I, I don't blame you, Buck, but, you know, uh, so we balance these things off. When we, you know, when you have a property of, of you know, well, it's a very significant value. And so we want to get some views. We want to provide improvement to the environmental aspects of the property. And, and that's how we uh, work with the Conservation Commission, uh, as Buck might recall. We used to do that with him. So anyway, so that would be our further presentation. I don't know if Karen wants to say anything. Mr. Chair. Yeah. Um, I listened to that and I had two two comments. One is all they had to move it was five feet uh, towards the road and it would have been an improvement. But that doesn't justify the fact that it probably could have been moved 100 feet and getting out of the conservancy district. It's like um, a little bit of improvement doesn't justify it as approvable. And I don't know how to, I think I've been, um, I don't know how to address this value thing. I'm, I don't know where value of the property comes into our jurisdiction, um, but I don't think it's there. I just, I raised that under uh, deliberations for other members of the board to sit there and uh, contemplate. Okay. Mr. Chairman, one final comment. Yes. The, uh, you know, the town of Chatham has uh, made the Conservancy District uh, concomitant with the floodplain, pretty much. And so when we talk about the Conservancy District, we're not talking about wetlands. We're talking about an area that's all upland vegetation, you know. So what are, what are we protecting? You know, the idea of you know building something there. The, the only risk involved is the, the possibility that someday there might be a flood that might actually touch this structure. You know, the value, the the, the conservation value, the conservancy value that this property is getting because of the uh, the extensive Invasive removal it improves uh, food source, habitat, and the quality of vegetation is going to go up 100%. And so the, the, uh, the fact that Buck wants everybody to live on the street uh, with the house, you know, right up alongside the street, uh, you know, doesn't change the fact that we're providing huge value, conservation value, to this property. Mr. Okay. Chair. Uh, oh. Okay, we got to move on here, Buck. Okay, thank you. Yep, uh, Mr. Thompson. Um, deliberation there, deliberations. Um, I'm for the project. Uh, I'll let it go at that. I can appreciate what Buck is saying, though. Um, um, I'll let it go at that. Okay, Megan. I am for the project. I will say, and I, I don't think that this is particularly pertinent to our to what we deal with or purview, but I don't love the fact that you can redraw the lines of your property to save on property taxes, and then when it's time to sell it, recoup the entire value because you can condo the property. I Something about that just doesn't sit well with me. Um, but I, that being said, in this particular instance, I, I think there is suitable land and it's not more detrimental to the neighborhood to have these two units. I just, I have a problem with, with that. Okay. Dennis. Uh, Dennis Sullivan. Yeah, I think it's a very nice project. 
uh, versus what's there. Um, it certainly is not more detrimental to the to the neighborhood. Um, it's a uh, I think it's a wonderful improvement. And if I were voting, I certainly would vote in favor of it. Dave Veach. Um, I, um, I, I'm in agreement with Dennis, uh, uh, and, and others have spoken in favor of this. Um, I, and I hear Buck's arguments, um, but I, I think that we also, by and large, look at the proposals that come before us with respect to what's there now, what's on the ground. And, um, and they are making improvements, as Mr. Riley has pointed out, with respect to the, to the Conservation Commission's uh, jurisdiction and concerns and things. And they are improving those things, and, and, and they've achieved, um, uh, it's, a, a, it's a balancing act. Um, and I don't know that um, be just because they have enough uh, land outside of the um, <clears throat> conservation to to have the houses up on the road. I don't see that as an appropriate um, uh, way to to view this uh, this proposal. I think it's a good proposal. I think it I think it can suit the interests of the property owners, and I'm I would hope to, that we can um, um, satisfy the conservation commission. I certainly don't see that the proposal for, in, I think it meets all of our criteria. It's not substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood. I think it's actually an improvement uh, for the neighborhood. I think the designs that they put forth are nice ones and, uh, and compatible with the location and with each other. Uh, and so um, I, can, I will support it. Yeah, and, and from my spin, uh, it comes down to you know our criteria is it satisfied? Yes, uh, it is certainly not uh, substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood. So for us to invoke, uh, you know, and say, well, you move it back another 25, 30 feet, this would be great. But as Mr. Riley has pointed out, from a conservation standpoint, where they're putting it is an improvement. And so not only is it an improvement to the neighborhoods, an improvement to the conservation. So for us to hold it up because <clears throat> it could go someplace else, uh, I just don't see that we should do that or that that's our purview to do it. So, uh, Buck, uh, you wanted to put in a last word, I believe, so please do. I'll hold my ground and we'll vote. Okay, very good. Uh, Mr. Chair? Yes. If you will, um, anyone that may potentially vote in opposition, if they could please provide specific reasons for um, us to be able to put in our decision letter as to why, what specific criteria they're voting in opposition to, I would appreciate that. Very good. Yeah, that's always true, not just in this case, but it's always true. So, Paul, um, let's talk about conditions, and, and I'll go first, but... Um, this particular applicant, uh, we've had some difficulties in the past with uh, parking and that sort of thing and all that. So that I would think, even though where it is, we would want to have all of our usual conditions uh, enforced. How do you feel? Well, uh, the, I, I take it that the uh, concept is that the construction will start as soon as they can get their approvals and get moving on it. Is that correct, Bill? Uh, uh, that's correct. I mean, the, uh, uh, I haven't spoken directly with uh, them as to their schedule, but uh, the, uh, yeah, and they would like to get going. And I think that uh, I can appreciate uh, the chairman's concerns, but uh, you know, we've never been involved in a lot of this size. It provides uh, the buffer uh, to neighboring properties into the street, and uh, so I think that the the summer prohibition is is uh, not appropriate. There's plenty of room on the property to uh, keep all the vehicles. And happy to have the no weekend and eight to five. 
Well, uh, you know, it seems to me that there is an awful lot of room on the property, so that clearly everything can be contained on site. Have the prior problems with uh, Eastward been in that area? Yes. Uh, and so, and, so and, and also, Polly, you know, if you look at this project, you're talking a year and a half to two years before both of these things are done. I mean, we're talking a long period of time. Well, uh, how about other members? How do you feel about conditions? Dave Veach, what do you think? Um, well, I think um, I, I think that we certainly would um, have our condition about uh, vehicles um, contained on the site because we don't want them parking on the pavement up in front there where the fishermen like to park and, and shellfish, <laughs> etc. cetera. Um, so I think we want to have that condition. Um, it is a, a pretty sizable lot. I think that I, I think in this case, um, and it is going to take uh, time to do this, but if we constrain the activity during the summer, that's just going to lengthen it. So I think that this, that I could, I think your suggestion, Dave, the last time about hours of, of, of construction in the summer is a, is a good one if we are going to allow it. And so I, I could, I think that that's a good, uh, to apply that in this situation would be enough for me. So you you would not include uh, no exterior construction. No, I would just do put the hours that you suggested eight to five and no work on the weekends and, and, and leave it at that. And also everything I, on. Yeah. I just would like to say that I would agree. I think there are very few lots in town that you can do construction in the summer and contain everything. This is a large law. And so if we can, I mean, again, I was not present if there were previous issues. I was not on the board at that time, but I do feel like we should, if, if it's at all possible, we should allow people to work in the summer. And in this particular <coughs> case, I think there's enough space to do that. So, but you would agree, Megan, with uh, all vehicles parked on the site, no work on weekends and yep, eight to five? absolutely. Yeah, okay. Absolutely. Right. I just wouldn't do a, a no summer, you know, const yeah. exterior construction. Okay. Um, as, uh, this Bob, is a small you... sample. I, oh, yeah, Paul. As I, as I... Uh, Mr. I'll Chair, I have no comment. Sample. Okay. Paul? As I, as I look at the overall map, the, the houses that are on the neighboring lot at 191 and 193 are on the extreme far side. And the only other house that's evolved here is the one at 190, which is across the street. So we're really quite a distance away from uh, construction activity. Okay. So you'd go along with those three issues and not worry about exterior construction. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay. All right. Uh, Dennis, Dave Thompson, do you, uh, do you two have any thoughts on it? Um, yeah, Dennis, I would, I would agree with what has just been said. I mean, it's a pretty unique lot considering the size, and um, I, I certainly don't have any problem with summer construction. Okay. Uh, Dave Thompson? I think Dave's muted. Okay. Dave, are you yeah. muted, Dave Thompson? Mr. Thompson is... Um... <laughs> I don't know whether I'm muted or not. Can you hear me? Absolutely. I can hear you now, brother. Oh, fantastic. Okay. I'm against this thing of um, not letting them work on Saturday. It's a great makeup day. What if it's raining on Thursday? Um, give the guys a chance. I said the same thing over at Avalon. Um, give the guys a chance. Um, let them work Saturdays, six days a week. Give them the Lord's Day off. Um, but everything else I'd go along with. Give them Saturdays. Okay, thank you. Um, is, uh, is there anyone else who agrees with Mr. Thompson, or does everybody else want to stick with uh, Monday through Friday, 8 to 5? I would agree with Mr. Thompson. Okay, that's two that like the idea of Saturday. Uh, I personally uh, like to see him take Monday, uh, Sunday and Saturday off in the summer, but um, I think I would find something to do, I think. Um, 
Dave Veach, Paul, do you guys have any uh, concerns about Saturdays? I, I, um, I don't know. I'm not, I can go really could go either way on this. I, I do know that, um, that, you know, construction activity is, um, there's no getting around the fact that it's, it is disruptive, the noise, et cetera, all, all the way around. And, um, and we have had some problems in the past with, uh, and definitely, I think definitely the, the limiting of the hours, eight to five, very important. And um, with respect to whether we give uh, one day of the weekend off or both days, I, I, I don't feel strongly either way. Okay. How, Paul, do you care about Saturdays? Uh, I think... Uh... I don't think it makes any difference uh, given the location of the property and where the people are going to be. So, I would I would move to approve the application with the uh, restrictions that all construction activity and vehicles be contained on site. Um, that uh, there would be uh, no work permitted on weekends, and the construction activity would be between 8 a.m. and 5 p.m. only. Okay. Um, and that would be both days and the weekends, given the, yeah. the activity that we have on Mill Pond and so forth during the summertime. Okay. Uh, is there a second to that motion? I will second that motion. Okay. Then we will vote uh, on that. Uh, Dave Veach, how do you vote? Uh, Veach votes yes. Paul? Battle votes yes. Buck? Buck votes no. Dave Thompson? Dave Thompson votes yes. And I vote yes, so that passes four to one. Thank you, Mr. Riley. Uh, thank okay. you very much. Okay, do we have minutes to approve? We most certainly do. We have the minutes of December 17th, 2020. Okay. Um, were there any corrections by anybody? I did not receive any comments. Okay. So, Paul, would you make a motion, please? Yep. With Paul Simple, I'll move to approve the uh, minutes as published. Uh, David Veach, I, I'll second this, but I won't vote on it because I wasn't present. Okay. Uh, so, the four of us that, well, we can always have uh, Megan, you were there. Uh, Megan, went on, we're voting on the minutes. How do you vote? I vote yes. Mr. Thompson? Uh, Mr. Thompson votes yes also. Buck? Buck votes yes. Paul? Double votes yes. And I vote yes. So there you go. Uh, are there any public comments out there? Anybody wish to make a public comment? If so, indicate to Sarah, please, that you wish to do that. OK, time's up on that. I see nobody else on the <laughs> meeting. <laughs> so. I think uh, we're Mr. good. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, uh, Dave, this is Dennis. I just had one comment. Yes. Is Sarah looking for something from Buck in, uh, in his um, negative vote? Yes, I, I, oh, I yeah. do actually need um, specific reasons for your denial when, when you are voting in opposition to something. Um, typically, the board members are, are really great at providing me information as to why they're approving a project, but they don't necessarily state the reasoning behind opposing a project. And I do have to provide specific reasons in our decision letters. So if the board could in the future, um, please be aware of that, I, I would appreciate it. Okay, Buck, can you give Sarah some specifics, please? Yes, I can, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, but my first, con my first concern is that um, the house, I agree, is an improvement but in my mind, it could have been done uh, even a little bit more. I thought there was um, two acres of land or 1.8. I think that the driveways could have been shortened and it's really just the uh, house on the west side. Um, if they shortened the driveway, they could have moved it, I guess, 20, 30. I don't have a scale, but they could have pulled the development out of the conservancy district. I 
I believe the wording in the bylaw says the criteria that's listed, the 10 points, are at a minimum. You're allowed, I believe, or at least the way I read it, that you're allowed to add additional criteria. And, and my concern is we could reduce the uh, development in the Conservancy District and use um, some of the more of the buildable upland. And I still think the houses would be 100 feet from the street. Um, it's not like we're putting them on the curb, um, but that's those are my comments. Okay, okay. so my understanding, uh, Mr. Upson, is based on uh, Mass General Law and our specific criteria under Section 5B, you have concerns um, regarding the natural environment. Let's try to flip to this page real quick. Give me one second. Um, you have concerns about the suitability of the site, including but not limited to impact on neighboring properties or the natural environment, including slopes, vegetations, wetlands, groundwater, water bodies, or stormwater runoff. But, am, I, am I correct in that book? <laughs> um, would that be the specific criteria that you um, would have the most concern about in out of the 12 criteria that we have? I guess so. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So uh, the meeting is coming to an end, so we need to vote to complete our task for the day and to go into recess. So, uh, uh, rather adjourn. Uh, Dave Veach? Uh, Veach votes yes. Paul? Travel votes yes. Buck? Buck? Buck votes yes. Dave Thompson? Dave Thompson votes yes. Megan? Megan votes yes. Dennis? Sullivan votes yes. And I vote yes. And here on Stage Harbor, the time is 4.57. How do you feel about the time, Sarah? I would concur with 4.57, and that was a motion from Mr. Semple and a second by Mr. Beach. It was. <laughs> it was. Okay. Thank you all. We'll can reconvene in two weeks. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Sarah. And we are adjourned.